Welcome everyone. This is my proposal on interleukin-6 and neurodegeneration. So today we'll be looking at the background of metabolic disorders associated with the neurodegenerative diseases that they're correlated with and the information that led me to this investigation. Second, we're gonna go over a hypothesis I wanna test. And third, the question I want to test surrounding those hypotheses. Fourth, the methods I chose to test around those questions. And then last, we'll be go over, over my timeline of events and then look at some preliminary data after that. According to the World Health Organization, in 2019, diabetes was the ninth leading cause of death with an estimated 14.9 million deaths attributed to diabetes worldwide. This is a devastating disease to a lot of people. So it starts in 1552 BCE. An Egyptian by the name of Hesi Ra mentions diabetes like disease for the first time. It is mentioned in a, uh, a script called the Ebis Pyrus, and this gave remedies to the passing of too much urine. Hesi Ra was the first doctor to consider changing a patient's diet to help with the condition. The modern day description we use for describing what Hesi Ra saw is polyuria. 133 AD, uh, diabetes was again described by the mellitus, uh, the, sorry, the melting down of flesh and limbs into urine. The first, um, this first describes the relationship between diabetes, ischemia, and the subsequent loss of limbs. 1675, Professor Thomas Willis of Oxford University, in his book, Rational Pharmaceutical Treatments, describes the urine of his patients uh, with diabetes as being beautifully sweet. The method of tasting the urine was the first method for diagnosing patients with diabetes. 1776, an English physician, Matthew Dobson from Liverpool, discovered that when he evaporated a patient's urine with diabetes, the resulting residue was granulated substance that smelt and tasted of sugar. So this was an extension of the diagnostic procedure that Thomas Willis first discussed. 1857, Frederick Pavey was a, was a physician in London that had the largest cohort of diabetic patients to date. He concluded that there was a quantitative relationship between the degree of hyperglycemia and glycouria. Today, knowledge has helped doctors develop test strips used to diagnose diabetes. 1921, Frederick Banting discovers insulin. He used dogs to study um, as a model organism, and he would cut out the pancreases of dogs. He used cow pancreas extract to lower the blood sugar of depancreatized dogs. So this means insulin is officially produced and was cheap at the time. So let's talk about obesity. Being overweight raises your risk for type two diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. It can also increase the risk of high blood pressure, unhealthy cholesterol, and unhealthy blood glucose. Body mass index has a strong relationship to diabetes and insulin resistance in obese individuals, and the amount of non-esterified fatty acids, glycerol hormones, cytokines, pro-inflammatory markers, and other substances that are involved in the development of insulin resistance is increased. Obesity is one of the leading risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Obesity is the accumulation of abnormal or excessive fat that may interfere with the maintenance of an optimal state of health. The excess of macronutrients in the adipose tissue stimulates them to release inflammatory mediators such as tumor necrosis factor interleukin-6 and reduces the production of a protein called uh, adiponectin and that predisposes, predisposes the body to a pro-inflammatory state and higher oxidative stress. So this is a snowball effect of problems that if not taken care of early on with diet and lifestyle changes, uh, it just exacerbates. More and more children are being affected with obesity and diabetes each year. So what is diabetic neuropathy? Diabetic neuropathy is a type of nerve damage that can occur if you have diabetes. High blood sugar tends to injure neurons throughout the body. And diabetic neuropathy most often damages nerves in your legs and feet. The damage that occurs because of the condition can be somatic or peripheral. It is clear that the damage also occurs in the central nervous system as people with obesity and diabetes have shown to have cognitive impairments and 50% increased risk of developing dementia later in life. So that brings us to Alzheimer's, a type of dementia. Uh, 
On the left image, you can see a healthy brain. On the right, a brain with Alzheimer's disease. This is another disease that is devastating to so many people. And some of us here may have experience in dealing with family members with this horrible disease. Research shows a strong association with obesity in diabetic individuals having a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disorder. This is where amyloid beta plaques form in the brain, causing it to look like this over time. But what causes amyloid beta plaques is still being researched around the world. And there's many theories, but it is associated with obesity and diabetes. We know there is a alteration in the glutamatergic cholinergic neuron transmission and changes in the hippocampus region where learning memory takes place. We know there is a reduction in synaptic proteins at the synaptic terminals, but there's no treatment that exists for this disease. There are drugs, of course, that can help with symptoms associated with this disease, but there's no treatment once those amyloid beta plaques begin to form. So the issues strongly associated with obesity, diabetes, and diabetic neuropathy that have been tested are problems with learning memory, cognition, mental flexibility, plasticity, glutamatergic and cholinergic neurons in and around the hippocampus. These issues have been demonstrated in the pre-diabetic pre state as well, indicating that neurodegeneration is occurring prior to the diagnosis of full-on type 2 diabetes. So what protects the brain? The brain is protected by an epithelial tissue layer called the blood-brain barrier. It's made up of a highly selective semi-permeable layer of endothelial cells and they block solutes in circulating blood from non-selectively diffusing into the extracellular fluid in the central nervous system. And this is where neurons reside, the central nervous system. Blood-brain barrier properties are primarily determined by junction complexes and cerebral endothelial cells. These complexes are compromised of tight, um, tight junctions, and it's a restrictive matrix and biological architecture of the blood-brain barrier um, reduces paracellular diffusion while minimal vesicle transport in the brain and endothelial cells limits transcellular transport. Under normal condition, this largely prevents the extravasation of large and small solutes unless specific transports are present and pre prevents migration of any type of blood-borne cell. So this is changed in pathological conditions. The cells that make up the blood-brain barrier are endothelial cells, astrocytes, and parasites, seen in this image. Endothelial cells play a role in vasoregulation, tight junction, um, structure, independent of insulin transport, uh, regional CNS insulin signaling, and antibody transport. Astrocytes play a role in morphology, circuit connectivity, mitochondrial function, dopamine, ATP release, and glucose blood barrier transport. Last, pericytes play a role in cell proliferation, hyperpolarization, they protect endothelial cells, neuronal insulin sensitivity, and vascular development. So in the blood-brain barrier, there's pathological stressors like inflammation that can cause the blood-brain barrier to become what we call leaky. And this is when it's permeated. So specifically, all in the endothelial cells at their tight junction, the tight junction disruption is still under investigation. In many of these disease states, it is associated. But we do know the tight junction proteins are either altered by gene expression, altered in protein trafficking, or in post-transcriptional modification of which could compromise the integrity of our barrier. So let's look at two proteins I want to focus on. And these proteins that make up the tight junction in these endothelial cells are occludin and clodin. Clodins are a multi-gene transmembrane protein, and classes of clodins create this matrix of strands in between these, in these tight junctions within the intracellular space of adjugant epithelial cells. And they construct paracellular selective channels. Some things can pass through these, um, but they're typically very tight, nothing really does. So while others act as signaling proteins and facilitate cell behaviors, occludin is ubiquitously expressed in epithelial cells constructing predominantly at bicellular junctions. And its role is still poorly understood and it's under investigation in labs all over the world. Now let's look at cytokines. What are cytokines? They're small signal 
signaling proteins that are secreted by numerous cell types. Cytokines are very prominent roles in regulating both innate and adaptive immune, immune system, and they also initiate the process of inflammation. So cytokines function by acting on the cells that secrete them by autocrine and paracrine signaling. Most cytokines function in their local environment rather than in a systemic manner. And cytokines bind to specific cell surface receptors, thereby acting uh, intracellular signaling cascades that involves phosphorylation events that usually result in gene transcription. In some cases, cytokines have the potential to work against us. As amazing as the body is, there's something called a cytokine storm, which usually doesn't work out too good for people. Um, this is where cytokines are produced in large numbers in response to something like getting the wrong blood transfusion from a wrong blood type. And these cytokines release tons of signals that recruit immune cells and will end up damaging healthy cells when, um, when it goes uncontrolled. All right, now let's look at interleukin-6. This is a cytokine I want to focus on and otherwise known as IL-6. It is synthesized in response to infections and tissue injuries, providing host defense through the stimulus of acute phase responses. It controls hematopoiesis and immune reactions. Its expression is coordinated by transcriptional and post-transcriptional pathways and dysregulated continued synthesis of IL-6 plays a pathological role in chronic inflammation and autoimmunity, autoimmune disorders. It signals through intracellular J and K and JAK-STAT pathways, which are pretty well known. And studies using mice have shown correlation between elevated levels of IL-6 and a leaky gut barrier, which resembles the epithelial layer seen in the brain. We know from these studies that IL-6 is associated with epithelial permeability at the tight junction where there's change in expression. In these studies, it was found that the JNK pathway initiated AP1, which resulted in AP1 binding um, to a binding sequence on the clotin promoter region, which drives promoter activation downstream and it increased clotin gene transcription and protein synthesis, which promotes the epithelial permeability. So mice are very commonly used in a lot of these IL-6 studies and tight junction studies. So let's look at some of the cells surrounding the blood-brain barrier. First, we have astrocytes. They're an important cell for regulating the synaptic environment, neural activation, neural plasticity, and they do this through secreted factors. One of those factors is tenacin C or TNC. It's an extracellular matrix glycoprotein secreted by these astrocytes. And it's been shown in extracellular matrix remodeling to help with tissue repair and synapse development. Next, we have pericytes. So pericytes are intravascular mural cells fixed in the cellular basal membrane of microvessels and in the brain along capillaries, arterioles, venules in the CNS, central nervous system. So in the CNS, Pericytes are found in the neurovascular space between endothelial cells, astrocytes, and neurons. So these cells play an important role in the maintenance of the blood-brain barrier. Next, we have microglia. They are a primary immune cell of the CNS and are similar in function to peripheral macrophages. They act as a major inflammatory uh, cell type in the brain and respond to pathogens and injury by becoming activated. And when activated, they rapidly change in morphology. They proliferate and migrate to the site of infection or injury where they phagocytose and destroy pathogens as well as remove damaged cells. As part of their response, they secrete cytokines such as IL-6. So non-neuronal cells, as we've just talked about, they have been in a study, they were exogenously stimulated with TNC, and this is in vitro. And when exogenated with TNC, they increase levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as uh, tumor necrosis vector alpha, IL-6, IL-8, and they do this through the toll-like receptor 4 activation. So TLR4 is expressed at the surface of astrocytes and microglia and has been found to stimulate inflammation and neurological disease causing damage to neurons. So neurodegenerative diseases are irreversible and there's no current treatments for a leaky blood-brain barrier. 
what we ha now have seen is a correlation between obesity, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, chronic inflammation, blood brain bar barrier permeability, and IL-6. And this always leaves us with the chicken and the egg argument. Which one comes first? Which one initiates the next one? And this is what's being studied. But what we do know is that multiple of these neurodegenerative diseases and proteins and signals are correlated with each other. So this leads me to my hypothesis. Does a specific pro-inflammatory cytokine interleukin-6 play a role in the disruption of the blood-brain barrier in obese pre-diabetic pre mice? My first aim is how does high fat diet, how does high fat protein diet affect mouse cognition? How does lacking an IL-6 gene affect mouse cognition? So first off, I'll have four cohorts of mice. Cohort one will be an IL-6 knockout gene fed high fat diet. Next I'll have cohort two, which is an IL-6 knockout mouse um, fed a controlled diet, which is typical to our American diet. Cohort three is a wild type that'll be fed high fat diet and cohort four is a wild type fed a control diet. So this will let me compare the differences of high fat diets with and without IL-6 and a control diet against IL-6 knockout and wild type fed a control diet. So on the right image here, you can see what the high fat diet looks like and what a standard cage looks like for this experiment, with the water bottle and two or three mice per cage. I have the mice uh, divided between male and female evenly. And they were bred from birth. And at six weeks, they six weeks they start their diet of age. And they resemble at their age a young adult who is obese and pre-diabetic. So the first thing I'll be doing is using a assay called water Morris maze to test this question. Water Morris water maze is a very old but significant assay used to test learning memory and spatial awareness, which directly targets what's going on in the hippocampus. So this is done twice per cohort over 27 weeks, once at week 14 and week 26. So I have a short video here to show you guys how this assay usually works. This is volunteer ran so that I do not create bias by running the experiment myself. One of these four quadrants the mouse will be placed in. A timer starts for 60 seconds. The mouse has 60 seconds to make it to a hidden platform one inch beneath white milky water. So I'm looking at time and distance and velocity that the mouse spends in each one of these inner four quadrants or outer four quadrants. And he goes under four trials of this. So you can see the mouse, this is the first time the mouse was placed in this pool. The mouse doesn't know where the probe is yet to escape on. So his 60 seconds will come up and my volunteer will place the mouse on the escape pod platform for 20 seconds for him to memorize where it is. And throughout the next four trials that this mouse goes through in this one day over five days, four trials per day, the mouse will get better and better at learning where this platform is. And he'll be using spatial cognition and awareness to memorize where this is based off markers seen on this pool and around the room. So here's one of my awesome volunteers that helps me with this experiment. This is her holding the mouse on the platform for 20 seconds. So in between each trial, they're placed under a heat lamp. And this heat lamp um, is about 18 inches over the cage and they actually get a reward from this. They get some positive feedback, maybe some dopamine and serotonin from it too. They love being warm and getting dried off. They don't love swimming and being wet. So this is done between each trial and there's four trials per day of them swimming. And each time they're placed in a different quadrant in the pool. I'll also be monitoring the blood glucose levels of each mouse in all cohorts. And so I'll take a tail vein sample and track the blood sugar of the mouse as they become hyperglycemic. And as you can see, this mouse is definitely hyperglycemic because 296 milligrams per deciliter is borderline already diabetic. 
Second aim is what is the role of IL-6 on the blood-brain barrier in obese wild type in IL-6 knockout mice? So first method I'll be using is something called Evans Blue dye. So this is an intravenous injection. And in this injection, it'll go in through the tail vein and over 12 hours, it makes its way into the brain if there's blood-brain barrier permeability. So in this permeability example where the blood-brain barrier is compromised or leaky, you can see that the dye made its way into the brain. And so this is a more qualitative analysis where you visually confirm whether or not the blood-brain barrier is compromised. And I have a positive control uh, for this as well. Next, we'll be doing uh, some cervical vertebrae dislocation uh, brain extractions. And this is where I will extract the hippocampus seen in image seven here. And this hippocampus will be used for Western immunoblot to look at protein concentration of tight junction proteins. So I'll be looking at occludin and clodin, which make up the tight junction protein densities. And I'll be using actin as a protein to compare their densities to in these four cohorts. Um, in the two cohorts that are wild type, I'll be looking at um, IL-6 concentration compared to control to see if the high fat diet had a difference in IL-6 concentrations. And then in PCR gel electrophoresis, I may be looking at the RNA expression of astrocytes, pericytes, microglial cells. And then last, I'll be using a cryostat to section some brains to look if, see if I can visually examine differences in the four cohorts of the hippocampus to see if there's any differences in structure of the hippocampus. And I'll be using this microscopic comparison against all four cohorts. And I can also use this to stain to look at uh, types of nerve cells and non-neuronal cells specifically to see if there's a difference of them as well. So just to go over a timeline of what this mouse is, uh, what the mouse will be doing throughout this experiment, they are bred by me. They'll start their high fat diet at week six of life after being weaned from their mothers. They'll be going through their first water maze experiment at week 14, their second water maze experiment at week 26 of their life. And then I'll be injecting the Evans Blue brain extraction on some of the mice in each cohort um, prior to brain extraction at week 27. And then I'll be doing molecular analysis, cryosat, and microscopy um, from week 28 and so on. So here's just a quick look at some preliminary data at the weights of IL-6 knockouts being on high fat versus IL-6 knockouts being on a control diet. And as you can see over 11 weeks that these mice have gained quite a bit of weight. Um, and I would say this is a very significant difference. And by these trend lines, you can see that these patterns look like they are not going to cross each other. So they are well on their way to obesity, if not obese already as a young adult. So my future goals are to look for potential markers and potential targets that can be used to diagnose or to treat people with blood-brain barrier permeability before it becomes Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative diseases. Find more correlation between neurons and proteins that are involved in tissue damage. Look at potential treatments for the mouse um, as it's aging um, to look at blood-brain barrier repair options. And then what would be nice would be to long-term use 16 sRNA, the mouse's microbiome in cohorts to examine differences that may affect the gut-brain axis. Since one of the main theories that leads to dementia and Alzheimer's is that amyloid beta plaques are antibacterial protection. So somehow this bacteria from leaky gut barrier could be making its way um, across the blood brain barrier and into the brain where amyloid beta plaques are formed in response to protect the brain from microbes and infection. Thank you for your attention today. And I look forward to defending my thesis 
uh, when I finished the experiment. 